because the same kind of cops are right here in Lompoc, they're right here in Santa Barbara, they're right here in Santa Maria, and if you don't believe me, welcome Dan Petrie to the show. Dan. Hey, nice to be back, Mr. Wagner. Are you glad to be back? I am, and I'm sorry for Mr. Thomas's heartbreak, and uh, like I was just mentioning, it's, it's, uh, mine's been going on for 30 years, so... Um, I feel sorry for what he's gone through, but I've gone through it for 30 years. So, well, let's start um, at the top. This is your your time to tell, tell right. America what they did to you right here. I am. First of all, I like to say who I am in my own words because I'm tired of the media making me out who I'm not. So I'm going to tell America who I am. My name is Dan Petrie, and I live in Vandenberg Village, California. I am not the Dan Petrie that played for the Detroit Tigers. I was also an all-star pitcher for Cabrillo High School. When the other Dan Petrie was drafted, many people thought it was me. That is how good I was. There should have been and could have been easily two Dan Petries in the majors. What happened to me was when Dr. Gordon, a major league doctor that gives physicals and checks the overall condition of a major league prospect's arm, and examined my arm in 1980, he discovered that and told me and all teams interested in me that I needed rotator cuff surgery on my throwing shoulder, thus my career and hopes of being drafted were over at 20 years old. Because in the late 70s, you did not come back from this kind of surgery. There was no miracle surgery in the 70s. A surgery like this ended your career. I've always wanted to meet the other Dan Petrie, just so he knows there could have been two of us. This is the truth of what happened to me. I did not get all into drugs and ruin my baseball career, and I have passed every drug test I've ever taken since 1985, and where I live does not allow any illegal drugs, and there is absolutely no traffic. This is my story in my own words. My family moved to Vandenberg Village in 1966 because my father was in the Air Force and we got stationed here from Japan. In fact, he is in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio for his heroics in World War II. So I come from a proud military family. What my father did was him and his pilot took out two planes in Nazi Germany on their way to Spain. They were carrying Hitler's top lieutenants and documents of the Hitler regime. What my father and his, co and his pilot did was they stopped the Nazi regime from taking and starting over in Spain. I am basically an expert on the Nazis because I've lived it my whole life. And that's a little bit about my father and why we got to, and I'm of course proud of my dad, what he did. He would never talk about his heroics. In fact, we didn't even know he did this great deed until he had passed away and was inducted into the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. That's the kind of hero he was. He never even mentioned it to the family. In, in, uh, when I was 11 years old, I joined Village Hills Little League. And, and Well, when I was 8 years old, I joined Village Hills Little League, and it was probably its first or second year. The Little League was built by Village Realty. That's how long I've lived in Vandenberg Village. I, just, I basically know the whole history of Vandenberg Village and Lompoc, because I've lived there since 66, or a lot of the history. At 12, I, at 11 years old, I made All-Stars, and I would continue to make All-Stars until I was 18. At 12 years old, we lost to a, a top pitcher from Fillmore, and when I was 14, I beat that pitcher from Fillmore in All-Stars. He then went on to be the single-A player of the year in high school. These are the kind of people that I beat growing up. If you don't believe I was one of the most feared pitchers to ever come out of Cabrillo or Lompoc, just ask Casey Candell who played for the Astros and the Dodgers, or Jesse Orozco, the all-time appearance leader for saves uh, for pitchers, for relievers. All These are my friends. Just ask them. They'll tell you all about me. When I was 14, I made varsity. I was a sophomore. At the time, I was the youngest guy to ever be on varsity for Cabrillo, a storied baseball program, even though it was only in its early years. They had just had the number one draft pick the year before, in 1974, um, went to the Astros and the whole nation. My junior year, I pitched the one nothing win against Lompoc that they showed the picture of. That was the actual game picture from Lompoc when I beat Lompoc one nothing in 1976 to win the Northern League Championship. I, I beat a great Lompoc pitcher, uh, Mix Roll, and we have become friends over the years. He, we dueled it out. Some people claim it was the best baseball game ever between the two storied schools. I think it was because I was there. I lived it. It was like a football game, a baseball game with a football attendance. I then would go on to play All-Stars and make All-Stars, like I said, from 11 to 18. 
From 16 to 18, I played for Senior Baby Ruth All-Stars, and I went approximately 10 and 1, and we came one game from the World Series all three years. I was one of the star pitchers. In other words, one game from the World Series, like I said. Okay. At 16, I also pitched against the Santa Maria Indians in a semi-pro team, Lompo Cad. And I beat the Indians at 16 years old. I'm the youngest pitcher to ever beat the Indians. Scoob Nunes was, was with them way back then, even. Jesse Orozco got the save in that game. He was 18, I was 16. That's why I know Jesse. We played together. At 20, my baseball career was over, as stated. So I started playing slow pitch softball, and I coached and played until I was 32, earning many alternatives at third base. Even though I couldn't pitch anymore, I still had a rocket arm and could gun people at third, from third to first. And if you don't believe me, just ask anybody who ever saw me play. My best alternate came when I was only 20 years old in the C-State Finals, where I was all tourney honors in the state at third base and mentioned in Slow Pitch magazine. So even though I didn't make it to the pros, I still excelled at Slow Pitch. I played for 10 years, and then I started coaching the alumni game for Cabrillo. And a few years back, while I could still play at 45 years old, I doubled off the fence, and the Lompoc Record did a story on how I still had it. I said, still had it. I never lost it, jokingly to the reporter. In 1989, I walked into a karaoke bar and fell in love with it, and I've been singing karaoke ever since. You either love it or you don't. It's one of those things. In 1985, I started my own karaoke business, and primarily at, at Butler Brothers in Lompoc. And then in 1995, I started my karaoke showcase at the Lompoc Flower Festival, which is now in its 16th year. I bring some of the best singers all over the central coast of Lompoc, and we opened the Flower Festival. Um, and then in 1992, I put together a state bowling team called the Magnificent Five. We, we got 11th in the whole state out of probably 10,000 bowlers. And the last time I bowled in men's scratch league, I had a 945 four-game scratch series with a 298 high, followed by a 255. I took all monies at the end of the years against the best bowlers in Lompoc, which didn't make a lot of them too happy. But I've always been a very competitive person. I love my family greatly. And to all, so to all the haters and the liars that have spread lies about me and innuendos over the years, now you know the truth of me. I'm asking the media to tell the truth about what happened at Diablo in 1980 and who I really am. And thank you, Mr. Wagner. You're welcome, Dan. So that's your background. We, now we have a background. You could have been a great baseball player. Correct. You, you were a sportsman, a, a local celebrity. And that young lady that you married, she was pretty happy to have you. Right. When you got married. Yep. But then... Some scumbag was let out of prison. That's right. By the cops and the lawyers working together to use this scumbag. I think scumbag, seeing his rap record, is, is the proper. There's a very bad little black and white photo here. We really can't get very good shot of That's that. the fake ID given to him. Really? And his real name wasn't Alan Christopher. That's his fake name given to him by the sheriffs or the state or whoever. I'm... Still not sure who yet. And that's but. what he looked like in 1984? So, wow, this is like more than 25 years ago? He doesn't mm -hmm. look like that today if he's still alive. No, he's probably not even alive anymore. But he's probably drugged to death. And uh, this is his record. What was his real name? Leonard Lehane. Leonard Lehane. And why did they want to let him out of jail early to do what? Well, I got a job at Diablo Canyon. And for those of you that didn't see the show I was on before with him, I'll rephrase or recap a little bit what I said. Um, in 1980, I got a job at Diablo Canyon as a security guard, and I was newly married to one of the prettiest girls to ever come out of Lompoc, California. I never say my wife's name or anyone in my family's name for their protection, obviously. I'm not going to do that. I'm not stupid. So this is, this is basically my fight for justice. So Leonard Lehane had uh, an arrest... In 71 in Massachusetts, yeah. two, three, four. His whole life. Five, six, into 72. Career criminal. Uh, down to March of 72, unarmed robbery, mm -hmm. possession of heroin. Uh, this was a bad dude. Yeah. And they let him out of yeah, prison like locally it, and, and gave him a fake ID so he could rape your wife? Basically, they took a guy out of prison a career criminal that had committed numerous armed robberies and was a heroin addict, and they gave him a fake name, and they planted him at Diablo Canyon, and they gave him a job for Pullman Power. This is why my life's been in danger 
for 30 years because as a 20-year-old security guard working at Diablo Canyon, I witnessed this whole crime. I witnessed the crime spree. This is what I witnessed. People want more detail. This is exactly what I witnessed. Tell us. Okay. I knew he worked for Pullman Power because he would walk by me when I worked at my guard shack and he checked badges and I recognized him because he's a, a, one of the, the construction workers. So one day, my wife, we would be married about eight months and we saved our money and we didn't have very much money. We got our first apartment right in the middle of Pismo on Wadsworth and it's two blocks or so from the police station. Okay. So in about, in about our second week, my wife called me from Madonna Inn where she worked in the gift shop and they said, she said, there's this guy at the gift shop who's harassing her and being real sexual with her and would you please come and stop him or talk to him or something? And I said, okay, you know, honey, I'll be there. I was 8, 20 years old. And I come up and I confront this guy and I, and I recognize him as the construction worker that I'd seen at Diablo Canyon. And my wife made the mistake of giving him my name because he probably went up and talked to her and she, she probably said, yeah, my name's so-and-so. And she probably said, my husband works at Diablo, and he, she pro he probably said, well, so do I. And, you know, when you're friendly with somebody till you know him, she didn't know he was an undercover narc who was going to eventually, um, and there you see, that's how we looked at 20 and 18. There's, that's our prom picture. So uh, just to show you how beautiful she was. And, you know, I hate having to show that picture, but it's the only way I can prove she was a beautiful girl, you know. And, and well, you're a pretty handsome dude there. Well, that's when I was a star baseball player. So basically we were like, Prince William and Kate Middleton. I mean, to, to sum it up to the general public, we were a young, handsome um, couple. And what happened was this narc saw my wife and he said he's going to have her. And he, he, he almost did. He almost murdered me for her. Now, how that happened was I confronted him. And I said, will you please leave my wife alone? And he, he, he's like, yeah. He goes, well, I got the power to ruin your life, you know. And I didn't know what he was talking about. But now I, now I know what he was talking about. And he did ruin your life. Well, he did ruin my life. He, and, he, and he ruined my life because of all the corrupt police officers that work from basically Paso Robles to Santa Barbara. They're ridiculous corrupt. And uh, he couldn't have done it without him. He couldn't have done it without Tom Sned. And he couldn't have done it without, you know, uh, just, you know. That's why I've been trying to um, tell my story for so long. And I actually tried to testify in the Michael Jackson case because I know the police and Tom Sned and Lompo have some criminal elements. And, and I know because of my case, you know. And it's that simple. And I knew Michael Jackson was probably being railroaded. So I actually tried to get a hold of, of Mr. Mezzaro, um at the courthouse. But I was always, ref you know, people think you're nuts. They just, oh, you know, you don't want to see it. Well, if he, if he really wouldn't known my story, he would have saw me. <laughs> yeah, well, so, but cut to the chase. Let me get to what happened now. Okay, each time I got into, in contact with Leonard Lehane, who I didn't know was Leonard Lehane yet. I thought he was Alan Christopher. I would call the police and I would say, will you please come and arrest this guy? He's harassing my wife. He's stalking her. He won't leave her alone. And every time I talked to a dispatcher, he said, well, there's really nothing we can do right now. Well, I made the mistake of saying his name, Alan Christopher. So the dispatcher was thinking, gee, that's our narc. <laughs> so he's probably out busting somebody for drugs, and, the, and so we're, just, we're not going to do anything. Well, that's not what he was doing. He had, no, he had no intention of busting people for drugs, okay, America? He'd been in prison most of his life. So when he got out of prison, he said, man, I'm just going to go target beautiful women. I don't care about busting people for drugs. <laughs> it's, it's obvious what he did. He took the opportunity to basically go on a rampage, just like Charlie Manson would if he let Charlie Manson out. Let's let Charlie Manson out and see what he does. Well, what do you think he'd do? He'd probably go kill people again. Now, Dan, let me interrupt you for a second here, because I want to clarify something. You call uh, this criminal a narc. Narcs are usually people who are actually employed and get... Yeah, he was employed by the Sheriff's Department. By the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. No, the San Luis Sheriff's Department. I think San who Luis for. Obispo. Yeah. Well, good. Well, at least it wasn't. And how I can county. prove that is. But how can you prove that? Well, here's a falsified police report that Lahane did on me. Now, how he got this was, he actually followed my wife home one night from a dawn in around 10 o'clock at night, and she came into my house all hysterical, our first apartment on Wadsworth, and she said, "That guy that's been stalking me, he he, he followed me home and everything, and he, you know, I'm scared to death, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen and everything. He's only 18, so." Now he knew where I lived. Now this was in 1980? Right. Now he knew where I lived. What's the date on this report? 